please welcome Mr. Reyes. Thank you very much. We nailed the last name, that was perfect. And, and the name of the company, it's actually quite difficult. So I added a uh, step towards natural language understanding and explainability. Um, towards the end because the approach that we take actually incorporates some some explainability and I hope everyone appreciates the the um, Prior sessions debater. I mean that is an incredible achievement by, by IBM to be able to, to put a debater out there so It's over the summer. We were my company was profiled in the New York Times and what I wanted to share was There's a revolution going on in artificial intelligence, and it's actually not what you think it's not deep learning. Part of it's deep learning, connectionist methods, vector-based methods, but it's actually what's really, really interesting that a lot of folks are working on right now is the fusion of machine learning with knowledge representation and reasoning. So real quick, raise your hands. Who, who is familiar with knowledge representation and reasoning? I, I knew you were gonna raise your hand. <laughs> so, so you think about knowledge representation and reasoning as kind of these good old fashioned AI techniques and I'm going to get into some of that today. But before I get into the, the technology, which is where I love to go first, I'm actually gonna make an economic argument for why everything that we're doing in AI is critically important today. Before I started Kindy, I, I worked in finance. I actually worked at a, a, a law firm, I have a graduate degree in math. Um, I helped sell Merrill to Bank of America during the 2008 financial crisis. I helped unwind UBS's exposure to Lehman Brothers debt. And the weekend that Lehman went down in 2008, the partner at my firm asked me to analyze an amount of credit derivative contracts that when I left for business school three years later, I was still reading. I mean, tremendous amounts of information. And I'm from the school of thought that with AI, we, as people, can actually do more. It will not replace us. So the economic argument that I'm going to make is that as we've transitioned to a services economy, all we do all day long is read information, communicate with each other, and we need to process that information as human beings and ultimately make decisions with it. And it's, it's fascinating when you look at reading comprehension um, in the United States, 98.5% 98, uh, 98 of the United States can read, which is phenomenal. The global literacy rate has actually increased from above 20% to just over 80% um, through, 2000, through 2010. But what's fascinating is we've hired all those people. So as everyone, we taught them all to read, as the population increased, unemployment rates stayed the same, so we hired all these people to read and understand information as we transitioned to a knowledge economy. But what's fascinating is our productivity has gone down since the mid-90s. So if we plot productivity versus transitions on a chip, and you can do this with storage too, by the way, and transmission. Um, what's fascinating is we obviously see the exponential increase in transitions on a chip, but we see our productivity decline. I mean, I, I, think it's, I think it's fascinating like, to think that all of these technologies that we create, if we were to compare the modern knowledge economy to a manufacturing process, effectively what we've done is we've created technologies that stack raw materials up in front of the manufacturing plant, but we haven't actually increased or automated the manufacturing process. And that's where I think AI comes in. So it turns out that you and I, as human beings, we're the bottleneck in the modern production process. And that's because we can't read and understand information any faster than our parents or grandparents, even though we have more access to it than ever before. And why that's important is because at productivity growth of 2% a year over the last 30 years, and our productivity growth has only averaged more than 1%, just over 1% a year for the last 10 years, at 2%, our standard of living doubles every 35 years. At 1%, it doubles every 70, 70 years. So there's no guarantee that our children today will be better off economically than we are. I and mean, it's fascinating when, when you actually think, think about that. We are the bottleneck in the modern production process. So when you add AI to the economy, this is a study by Accenture, you actually see that global real GDP doubles in 
2035 versus without AI. So it's critically important in this time as we think about artificial intelligence and we build it, you know, I, I become so amazed with what it can do to actually remember why it's important for what we're actually doing. It's not just the math that's fun, it's not just building the systems that are fun, but it's actually critically, critically important that, that we build these systems. So, we take a unique approach at Kindy. And I, I started this presentation by saying that really the revolution that's happening in AI is the fusion of machine learning and knowledge representation and reasoning techniques. And I think there's three legs to the stool if you want to solve real world problems with AI. It's natural language processing to understand the, the natural language, uh, the machine learning to acquire the knowledge from data, and then the representation and reasoning to represent that knowledge and ultimately reason with that knowledge. So I'm sure everyone's familiar with, with uh, or if you're not, I encourage you to read it, um, Pedro Dominguez's book, the, the Master Algorithm. I love how he broke down the tribes. You can argue the merits and demerits of how he broke it down, but I think it's pretty good. Connectionists are the most popular technique that you'll see today and the one getting all the, all the newspaper ads, or uh, publications rather. We took a different technique, although we do borrow a lot of vector-based approaches. What we took is we took a symbolic approach and an analogical approach. And why we did that was really a few problems. Well, there's 10 um, in a paper published this year by Gary Marcus, and I encourage everyone to read it. We address four of those challenges. And this actually is a, is a market need. Is a lot of times when we sell to enterprises, they actually don't have the directly relevant labeled data to train a system. And this is a, this is a major problem for current machine learning techniques. It's, it's phenomenal. When you talk to executives, they go, I got a bunch of data. Can't you just shove it into the system and get a bunch of you know, magic out the other end? No, you can't. It needs to be directly relevant and labeled. The other one is actually working with natural language. So natural language has a hierarchical structure. So what I mean by that is you can use vector-based methods to find similarities between words. So I'm sure people are familiar with things like word to vec and glove and other things. So you'll, you, can, you can understand that computer and laptop are similar. But is a laptop a type of computer? Or is a computer a type of laptop? That relationship between, that hierarchical relationship, or directional relationship between computer and laptop is critically important for the understanding of natural language. The other one is that deep learning techniques struggle with open-ended inferencing. So a lot of times answers or knowledge are in different parts of the paper or the text that you're looking at. They're not just in one sentence in one area. You're going to want to acquire knowledge from that sentence, combine it with knowledge you acquired from another sentence, and ultimately solve or answer the question that you're looking at. And the other one is that these DL techniques are not sufficiently transparent. So people are adding knowledge representation and reasoning to make these things transparent. And I'll dive into what exactly that, that means in a second. So what's fascinating is, and I adapted this from, from DARPA, um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great slide that shows that the current popularity in machine learning, you see that these systems are phenomenal at learning from data, not very good at reasoning. So statistical inferencing is actually pretty weak reasoning. And there's all types of, of reasoning actually for, you can do your inductive, deductive, abductive, and analogical reasoning. Human beings can do those reasoning, but statistical systems right now cannot. The handcrafted knowledge systems are phenomenal at reasoning. But unfortunately, you had to hand code them. And you, it, it took a long time to ultimately acquire that knowledge from human beings or from data to put it into a system. So when you combine these approaches and you fuse them tightly together, what you get is a technique that can machine learn knowledge from data, but ultimately reuse that knowledge for advanced reasoning. So, 
why would you want to add machine learning to knowledge representation and reasoning? And I, I, I say it this way because when I first got into artificial intelligence, again, my, my background's in mathematics, I found it amazing that the schools of AI that I showed, those five, how much they disliked each other. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible um, how much they dislike each other. And when I bring up slides like this, it's, it's, it's actually interesting because a lot of the connectionist folks will say, I don't want to add KRR even if it does me meaningful things. And the machine learning, uh, or the KRR folks, I don't want to add machine learning even if it does meaningful things. But for, to add ML to KRR, what you can do is, as I was talking about, is you can acquire or machine learn the knowledge from the data or from a user using machine learning. And why you would add KRR to ML, um, you can use it for explainability because you are working in logic now, um, not in this black box, black box system. Uh, you ultimately have these causal relationships between things. Um, I think also that the target of ML should be a representation. So when you think about these networks ultimately converging um, to some fixed uh, point there, um, I think that should be some representation of a ontological structure or some knowledge representation. So your target for machine learning should be a representation. And for us, what exactly does that look like? So when we machine learn, because we do have a learning network, just like a, a, a deep learning network, we do get these, uh, and these things can get, get quite large depending on the, the size of your, your uh, uh, data set that we're ingesting is you do get these large network representations. But what we do is we actually contract them down to a fixed point so that that fixed point represents some abstraction. So what, what, I, what I mean by that is, is words um, um, can mean a lot of different things. We use words as an abstraction to convey to each other this very complex real world. We don't describe a cat by describing each a speck of fur on the cat. We just say it's a cat, and we understand that that's some complex representation uh, underneath that. So um, the advantages of representing data this way and ultimately um, collapsing it down to a fixed point is you get speed, um, speed and subgraph matching, which is what you're going to do when you do natural language question answering. Um, and you also get generalization power, meaning that you can actually use this knowledge base over and over and over again. So um, I machine learn this knowledge base in cancer research. I can use it for cancer research with any other organization. Um, I machine learn something for finance. I can reuse that representation for another financial services customer, um, which, is, which is interesting. It allows you to deploy systems much faster than you would with pure ML techniques. So our system, this is a busy slide because I had my engineer put it in. <laughs> Um, when we ingest data, what we do is we then machine learn a representation. Actually, we do all the NLP techniques, um, uh, semantic role labeling, co-reference, all of these, these techniques. Um, we use a lot of dependency graphs. Um, what we do then is we actually use SOA's um, conceptual graphs, if people are familiar with, with John SOA. So we'll parse sentences, turn them into a graph, we'll form a conceptual graph, We'll compute a signature, we call it. It's basically a place where we can look it up in the index and we store that in a larger graph. Um, and then on top of that graph, we build a bunch of enterprise applications. So um, enterprise search, um, analytics, anything you want to do on top of your unstructured text data now, um, you can do that with, with the system. So, so what does this mean? I started it by saying that, that DL was very data hungry. Um, we did some interesting um, research, I think it was about two months ago now, where if you take SQUAD, um, Stanford question answering uh, data set, and um, you use just Lucene search, uh, elastic search capability to answer questions, you get an F1 score about 15%. Um, if you use the current uh, leaderboard techniques um, using deep learning, with no training on the system, you actually get 6% F1 scores. When you train it on tens of thousands of labels, you can get above 50%, um, but again, those labels are, are hard to come by. 
Um, with our approach, we were actually able to get approximately 15% from zero knowledge. So ingesting data, parsing those, those sentences, forming them into a graph, acquiring the knowledge or the ontology, we call it, um, from the data itself, and then using that graph to do question answering. Um, you could do fresh start just, just right from no knowledge, uh, ingesting, ingesting data, and ultimately using that to answer natural language questions. So it's fascinating to think that we can start to build systems now fusing together machine learning um, and knowledge representation and reasoning um, that like a human being that knows how to read, knows how to reason, I can go in on any arbitrary data set and be able to start to do natural language question answering. And this is a big improvement over what you've seen historically and we'll come out with a research paper probably in the next 30 to 60 days on, on this. So, so just, just to leave you with a, a, a few things. Um, the community is moving beyond pure machine learning techniques into the fusion of machine learning with knowledge representation and reasoning. So I would encourage everyone here to reach back out to your professors um, who knew about knowledge representation and reasoning. Um, read the books from, from SOA. Um, get into knowledge graphs. Um, start to understand how can you fuse these methods together um, to understand unstructured text data. And I'll, I would also encourage everyone to remember why we build technologies, and that's ultimately to give to people. And if people are going to use artificial intelligence, I believe that it has to be explainable. And when you fuse these methods together, you then can cross over into the realm of explainability. So thank you very much for your time. I'll be over here taking questions. Uh, please come by. Thanks.